Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Barbara Stanwyck, Joseph Cotton, and Chester Morris in The Great Man's Lady. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. One day while I was lunching in the studio restaurant, I noticed a woman, a very, very old woman, seated at another table. I thought I knew most of the players in town, but she was so striking in appearance, I asked my casting director to find out who she was and something about her. I found out very quickly. The little old lady was 109 years old, and her name was Barbara Stanwyck. I hadn't even recognized one of my favorite stars. That just goes to show you what a convincing performance Barbara gave in the Paramount picture, The Great Man's Lady. She plays the same part tonight. The woman called Hannah Sempler, from the age of 17 to the age of 109. And with Barbara, we present two leading men. The brand new star, Joseph Cotton, and Chester Morris, who's just made a direct hit in the Pine Thomas production, Ariel Gunner. In the untold story of almost every great man is a great woman. The great man's lady is the drama of one of these, a strange chapter of love and adventure and sacrifice out of the lives of two great people. Think of all the changes that a woman 109 years old might have seen, from the first railroad train to the miracles of the present. Electricity, automobiles, radio, airplanes, and important everyday things like Lux Flakes which have made life easier and more pleasant for many millions of women. See, 109 years ago, that's uh, 1834, Andrew Jackson was president. Travel was by stage or sailing vessel. <laughs> Men wore beaver hats. The ladies wore crinoline gowns. And the washing, pity the poor housewife, was usually done by boiling the clothes over an open fire in the backyard. The women of that day would certainly have regarded Lux Flakes as a new form of magic. And it's still magic, but not new to most of you. Now the curtain rises on the first act of The Great Man's Lady, starring Barbara Stanwyck as Hannah, Joseph Cotton as Ethan Hoyt, and Chester Morris as Steely. Behind the deeds of every great man, you will always find a woman hidden in the shadows. Working with him, striving for him, urging him on. No man is ever really great without a woman at his side. These are the words of Hannah Hoyt, age 109 years, wife of the long departed Ethan Hoyt, the great man for whom a great western metropolis was named. On this spring day in the year 1941, Hoyt City celebrates the memory of its founder. In the park, speeches are made, the band plays, and the people sing. But the great man's lady is not attending the celebration. She's retired behind the drawn blinds of her old house. Here she's lived in peace for the last half century. Now the quiet is broken by the clamor of the press. Reporters from all over the country who invade her parlor. I'm sorry, gentlemen. Come on, come on. We want to see Mrs. Hannah Hoyt or Hannah Stempler or whatever she calls herself. She ain't seeing nobody, sir. Tell her the press is here. I done told her, sir. Well, tell her again. Go on. Here she is. Get a picture, Jerry. Hold it, Mrs. Hoyt. Thank you. Good afternoon, gentlemen. To what do I owe this peculiar honor? One more picture, please. Look this way, Mrs. Hoyt. My name is Hannah Stempler. May I ask why you intrude here? Well, I suppose you know what day this is. Yes. It's Ethan Hoyt Day. The whole city is celebrating. They're unveiling a statue of Senator Hoyt at four this afternoon. Yes. Will you be there, Mrs. Hoyt? Miss Sempler. Sorry, do you expect to be there, Miss Sempler? No. Why not? You were his wife, or were you? Wait a minute. Miss Sempler, I'd like to apologize for all of us, for our rudeness in breaking in like this. No, forget our rudeness. It's the public who's broken in. The public in whose eyes Ethan Hoyt has grown to the size of a national hero. The public, sir? You are the public? Miss Sempler, we come here seeking the answer to a great human enigma. A matter of history. 
Were you married to Ethan Hoyt? And if not, why did he die in your home? Was his real wife there? If you and he had any children, where are they? You see, Miss Sampler, if your claims are true, it would make him a bigamist. We ask you to prove these claims in the public interest. The public? You weren't the public. The public is made up of millions of private homes like mine. In our homes, we draw inspiration from the memory of our great men, like Senator Hoyt. You want to destroy that memory. You seek nothing but scandal. But you will find none here. I bid you good day. She can't prove a thing because the story's just a pack of lies. She's an old windbag trying to crash the limelight. Oh, stop it. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Can't you see she's helpless and all alone? She's a very old lady. Yes, it's true. I am old. Very old. But I've made no claims. I've told no lies. Whatever I know is a matter of my own private history. That is all. Okay, Miss Templer, let's go, Jerry. Miss Templer. Well, you came with the rest of them. What are you waiting for? Because, because I... Yes, I know. You got a public, too? Not yet, but I will have. I'm a biographer. A what? I'm writing the life of Senator Ethan Hoyt. Oh. Nice job, you... You like your work? I think he was one of the most, one of the most wonderful. Yes, so do I. I guess I ought to know about that. Oh, then you have to help me. I've got to know what part you played. Were you married to him? Did you have a child? Oh, I've got to know all sorts of things. That's why I had to see you. Oh, look away, girl. There's nothing much to see. Just a hundred or so years of memories. I ought to have been buried years ago. I I can't really say that. I'd like to live to be 200 years old. And then you and I both be old ladies. We could compare notes. <laughs> uh, you come back in a hundred years. Then I'll talk to you. Then you... You won't help me? Any good reason why I should? No. Except... I'm sorry. I'll go now. Here, girl. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, are you crying? Oh, one of the meanest things about growing old is to forget how important everything seems to young people. Yeah, come over here and sit down. I'm all right, Miss Templer. Sit down, I said. You know, girl, you need more gumption and spirit. Yeah. Now, where did you say you learned about Ethan Hoyt? In books. Oh, poof. You, you'll never learn a man out of books, nor a woman either. Oh, girl. Men were different in those days. Men like Ethan. There was a band playing in his heart and the devil in his eyes. And I... I was a very young lady in a stuffy Philadelphia house in the year 1848. I'd met Ethan before, once or twice. But the time I remember best was the night he came galloping up to my father's house. I saw him from the upstairs window, galloping back from the west, like a bright bit of the wind. Evening, Miss Templer. Hello. Hello, back. So I see. Well, come down and welcome me home. That's what you've been waiting for, isn't it? I haven't been waiting for you, Mr. Hoyt. I... I've just been looking at the moon. Uh-huh. There isn't any. Oh. Oh, good night, Mr. Hoyt. 
Cousin Bettina, did you see him? Well, I must say, Hannah. What's the matter? Making a public spectacle of yourself. Oh, don't be stuffy, Bettina. Did you see how he smiled? A gentleman would never have dared. A gentleman? You mean like my Mr. Cadwallader? I dare say he's never smiled in his whole life. Hannah! I almost died laughing when he proposed to me. Miss Sampler, I have the great honor to address myself to your favor. Your father and I are thoroughly agreed... Hannah, that... that's not very ladylike. What not? Making fun of the man you betrothed to marry. Oh, rats, he's really betrothed to my father. Hannah Sampler! Well, they made the agreement, not I. Parents know better. How do I look, Bettina? You know, I, I think he likes me. Who? He's in Hoyt, of course. Hannah... Well, he smiled, didn't he? He always smiles. Every time I see him, he smiles. That's because he's a ne'er-do-well. A what? Mama says he lives with the Indians and smells like a buffalo. Oh, prove it. Well, he makes his clothes from dead animals. That isn't buffalo. It's all the same. Well, then I think buffaloes must smell lovely, like like the fresh air and the sun. Good night, Bettina. Have a good sleep. Where are you going? Downstairs. But you can't. He's down there. That's why I'm going. Hannah Stempler. Where are you going, honey? Downstairs. Well, don't go in the library, child. Why not? Because there's having a big private confabulation in there. But Delilah, I need a book. Now, you're going to need two books when your father catch you eavesdropping, and they ain't going to be in your hands, neither. Oh, now, don't be quiet. Oh, right. There he is, Delilah. But it is. It's oh, isn't he? Come away, child. Come away. Mr. Hoyt. Gentlemen, I wish I had the power to make you see it with my own eyes. Two great rivers of the West coming together like an arrow. Like a sign from the almighty gentleman pointing out the natural site of a great new city. And the public buildings, gentlemen, all grouped around a great square filled with fountains and trees. And behind the city, a hill. And on the hill, home. Homes, gentlemen, filled with light and air. And the country itself, the West. Only I had the power to describe it. A virgin land as, as lovely as an unexpected smile. As beautiful as... As that young lady in the doorway. Good evening, ma'am. Hannah. Good evening. What are you doing down here? Oh, I am... Sorry, Father, I thought you might like some brandy. Good evening, Miss Templo. Mr. Cadwallader. Mr. Hoyt, this is my daughter, Hannah. Uh, Miss Hannah and I have met, sir. Oh, when? Well, the last time I was here. Oh. <clears throat> my daughter is betrothed to Mr. Cadwallader. Oh, oh, I, I see. Well, your health, Miss Hannah. I'm sure you'll be very happy. Oh, thank you. You may leave, Hannah. Yes, Father. <clears throat> you were saying, Mr. Hoyt? Oh, the truth of the matter is, Mr. Sampler, I need your help. Money and supplies. I came to you because, well... There was uh, no other business firm would carry your risk. Because you knew my father, Mr. Sampler. Yes, and had respect for his judgment. He was a man of great vision, sir. Exactly. Enough vision to say no to a venture like this. Exactly. You mean that... I mean no. But there's talk of a railroad. Don't you wild men realize what you're doing? Talk of expanding the country. The country is large enough as it is. Large enough, I agree. Yes, well, you listen to me, Mr. Sampler. You too, Mr. Cadwallader. This country is going to be bigger, a whale of a lot bigger. There's 2,000 miles of America out beyond the Mississippi. Land and riches beyond belief. But it's not going to belong to men like you, men who won't take a risk. It's going to belong to men who aren't afraid, men with luck in one hand and risk in the other. Oh, you're so right. You're so absolutely right. Hannah, I told you to... Excuse me, gentlemen. But, Father, I... I'm upstairs at once, Miss. Well, what... What was that he picked up on the way out? I believe it was a switch, sir. A switch? You really think he, he's good? Huh? I do indeed. You really believe in that sort of thing? He's a very headstrong young girl, Mr. Hoyt. Oh. Now, I suppose after you are married, you really intend to... Oh, yes. Uh, it helps maintain the home. Oh, I see. Of course, out where I come from, a woman is... You have women out west? Oh, yes. Some. Yes, but mostly Indian squaws, I presume. Mostly. Uh, only the Indians have that. Uh, I've heard otherwise. Well, don't let me influence you. Exactly. Uh, I suppose that you... Uh... I spend most of my time with cattle. Mm, but the women, I suppose uh, you... We rope them. What? Rope them, Mr. Cadwallader, and brand them with hot irons and hang them on forked sticks over a hot fire. Oh, you're joking. Women? Cattle, Mr. Cadwallader. Oh, uh, I thought we were talking about women. Women? Why, if we had women like you have back here, we'd treat them like queens. Sorry, gentlemen. Mr. Hoyt, I'd ask you to remain for supper right, only. Well, I understand. Now, just one thing more. About the matter of risk. I don't want you to go away with the wrong impression. We take risks every day. All right, this very year, it's a fair risk as we'll make only 10% profit instead of 12. Yeah, exactly. All right, gentlemen, I think you've both lost something. My odds are all or nothing. Good night. He didn't leave Philadelphia right away. 
I caught a glimpse of him, what dressed in his buckskin, galloping about town on his great black horse. And then one night, <laughs> there was a moon this time. I was lying in bed when I heard a noise at the window. Who is it? Hello. Oh, what do you mean by... Go away. In the morning. For goodness sakes, will you please... I mean I'm going for good. Oh. Come down. I want to say goodbye to you. I can't. You'll wake everyone up. You the... come down. I'll wake the dead. Are you crazy? Yeah. I believe you are. Coming down? Of course not. I can't. Come up there. No, no, wait. Uh... Oh, wait till I get dressed. I'll come down. Isn't it funny? Ethan thought he was talking me into something that night. There I'd been setting my cap for him. And he didn't even know it. Poor Ethan. He never had a chance. It's a uh, nice night. Yes. I uh, thought it'd be pretty here. Uh, moonlight and everything. Yes. They say a full moon makes people do strange things. Yeah, I guess so. Like it. Not me here at all. Not really. No, I... Uh, I think we'd better go. Do you feel strange, too? Mm-hmm. You're afraid of something. Mm-hmm. Of what? I don't know. Yes, I do. You shouldn't be here, Hannah. Well, of all things, did I ask to come? No, no, no. I mean... Go on. You know what I mean. I can't imagine. You know I'm in love with you. Oh, no. Believe me, Hannah. Maybe. You've got to. I won't have a chance to say it again. Do you love me? Maybe. I think you do, Hannah. Oh, Ethan, yes. Hannah. You know something? Hmm. You don't smell at all like a buffalo. Oh. Don't I? No. Why? You're crying. Oh, I, I've got a handkerchief. Here. here, let me have it. Now. Now, look up here. What are you crying about? I don't know. Because I'm leaving? I don't know. Hannah. Hannah, may I keep your handkerchief? I'd like to take it with me. Something of you. Oh, Ethan. Take me with you, too. Take me. Yes. I ran away with him that night. And we joined the wagon train on the west bank of the Ohio. We were married out in the middle of the prairie land with the wagon train passing by. The storm gathering overhead. For the good Lord strike the thunder, what men would join, yea, verily. I can't find the place, Just John. hit the high spot, Parson. Rain's almost here. Yep, here it comes. Maybe I can do it without the book. Go ahead. Hold hands, please. Ethan, do you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? I do. And do you, Hannah, take this man to be your lawful wedded husband to death? Doesn't you part? I do. Then let no one put a thunder whom God hath joined forever. I pronounce you man and wife. Whoa there. Whoa, boy. I've got to take care of the horses. Whoa. Whoa. Well, Mrs. It's all over. Yes, of course. Plane waiting's two bits. Pretty one for the dollar. Well, we haven't much money. Would a plane one be all right with you? Sure, sure. Now, let me see. Uh, got the waiting certificate here. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's Ethan's last name? Ethan Hoyt. H-O-Y-T. H-O-Y-T? Yes. Hannah Semple. S-E-M-P-L-E-R. Semple? <laughs> there you are, Miss Hoyt. Holy... Thank God. you. Oh, Coming, Ethan. Good luck. Thank you. Horses is going to bolt if they don't get moving. Here. Up you go. All right. Get I'm up. ready, Ethan. Get up. Well, Hannah. Well, Ethan. Got to kiss the bride, didn't I? Oh, it doesn't matter. I've got other things, too, I suspect. Flowers, a ring. It's what the man said that counts. He said forever. That's right. You and me, Ethan. 
forever. In a few moments, Mr. DeMille presents Barbara Stanwyck, Joseph Cotton, and Chester Morris in the second act of The Great Man's Lady. Now it's intermission time, so let's go along with our reporter, Libby Collins, as she talks to Mary Sue, a wartime bride. Oh, whew. what a whirl. Oh, your dress is a dream, Mary Sue. Thank you. It's cotton. I chose it especially so I can wear it summer evening. It'll pack beautifully, too. Talk about packing. Let me show you my trunk. My goodness, what are all these things? My home, if you please. Everything I need to dress up one room. Let's see. Colored table linen. Oh, aren't they pretty? And here are curtains. Even a couch cover and pillow covers. And a string rug. And, and all these other things, see? Why, you can have a home anywhere. Well, that's what I want with Bill and me on the move all the time. And I can always keep everything thick and fan, too, because all these things are luxable. That's right, Mary Sue. Lux makes living out of a trunk or a suitcase a lot easier. You don't have to take so much with you when you can freshen things so easily. And your things will stay bright and new-looking longer when you stick to gentle, new, improved Lux for their care. It's the mildest, gentlest Lux ever made. Super safe, not only for pretty dresses like Mary Sue's, but for your colored linens and curtains, all your household washables. Lux things last longer. Yes, Lux things last longer, and Lux lasts longer, too. Gives you richer suds, thrifty suds that do more work than ever. Get new improved Lux flakes tomorrow. It comes in the same blue box you know so well. But now, it's better than ever. New improved Lux flakes. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of The Great Man's Lady, starring Barbara Stanwyck as Hannah, Joseph Cotton as Ethan Hoyt, and Chester Morris as Steely. From the pinnacle of more than a century of life, Hannah Hoyt looked backward to the year 1848, to the time when she and Ethan rolled westward in a covered wagon to found a great city on the barren prairie land. Most of the wagons were going through to California for gold. But we left them at Fort Scott and turned off on the trail for Hoyt City. Whoa, whoa, whoa there. Ethan, are we going to stop here? Well, looks like a good place to camp for the night. Well, can't we go on? Well, there's a riverbed just ahead of here. I want to risk a flash flood during the night. No, no, I mean all the way on to Hoyt City. It's only six more miles. Well, uh, look, Hannah, there's something I've got to tell you. Won't it wait? No. I mean, you take the morning. Things look brighter. What thing? Well, Hoyt City. Oh, don't worry about that. The way I feel right now, Hoyt City will look like, like Philadelphia almost. Well, that's what I mean. You mean it won't? Well, not exactly. Oh, I don't expect it to. But just imagine... A real bed to sleep in, people, lights, hot water, and clean clothes. I know, Hannah. A home but, on the uh, hill overlooking the city. A public square filled with fountains and trees. What kind of trees, Ethan? Well, oh, no, uh, don't tell me. I like surprises. Oh. Well, that's fine. I got my surprise, all right. Wake City in 1848. One street. Ankle deep in mud, and a series of ramshackle wooden buildings. That's all. Oh, yes. Uh, there were four rooms. Well, here we are, Hannah. This is it. Yes, Ethan. Oh, I'm sorry, Hannah. I wanted to tell you before. I, I know how it must have sounded. Like I'm just a plain liar. No. You were just seeing it the way it's going to be, that's all. A great city can grow here, Ethan. You, you really think so? We'll build it, you and I. Sure we will. People will help us. That's how I meant it. But it can really be like a city glittering in the sun with towers like silver and gold. And people, Ethan. Thousands of people building something all new and shiny. Hoyt City. <laughs> Hoyt, your city is nothing but a jumping-off point for the gold fields. You ought to see that. You've been here a whole year now. Where's the building that was going to start? Where's all Mr. the people? Mr. Frisbee, if the railroad came here, we'd... My dear Mr. Hoyt, railroads cost money. 
So far, you haven't been able to raise a penny. You mean you won't put it up either? Is that it? Well, now I can say that. I've come all the way from the east to look this thing over. I don't enjoy wasting my time, Mr. Hoyt. All right, what do you want? I want Hoyt City, a fair share of it, say uh, three quarters of the land. You can't, it's mine. Uh, sit down, Mr. Hoyt. You're in no position to argue. <laughs> now, what's that, Indian? No, my wife, rabbits, again for dinner. Oh. Oh, uh, uh, now look here, Hoyt. I brought all the papers. You just put your signature here and you'll get your railroad. My wife won't listen to it. Your wife? What's she got to do with it? She owns half. Then get her to see it our way. It's to her own advantage. You see, Hoyt, I happen to know her father. Fine man. Fine Philadelphia home. What's she be coming out here? A crack shot, among other things. And she deserves better. Give her back what she has. A real home. Clothes. Social position. You don't want her to turn into one of these fairy women, do you? Evening. Oh, uh... Hannah, this is Mr. Frisbee, uh, my wife. Uh, oh, uh, uh, good evening. Howdy, Mr. Frisbee. I've got to clean these here rabbits, Ethan. Uh, Hannah, Mr. Frisbee wants you to sign this paper. Let the rabbit wait. This is important. Nothing ain't important as it is, Ethan. Hannah, stop this foolishness. It's just a matter of your signature, Mrs. Hoyt. The land transfer, Hannah. You mean you want me to sign it, Ethan? Yes. But I forgot how to write. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Hoyt. Uh, I'm a prairie woman, Mr. Frisbee. Is this here the paper? That's right. It's the... Mrs. Hoyt, you're tearing up the agreement, why you... Now get out. Look get here. Get out, scat. Mrs. Hoyt. Go on, you miserable little sneaky little... You rabbit. Well, I suppose that settles it. Oh, I don't think your Mrs. Frisbee will bother us for a while anyway. Uh, he won't build the railroad either. Ethan... You mean you really wanted me to sign it? Not a matter of what we want. It's a matter of fact. Wait, it is a failure. I can't believe it, Ethan. Look at it, Hannah. I can't it's... believe that you can change like this. Give up so easily. Not me. Here, I'll show you. Look at your hands. A year ago, they didn't look like that. But I don't mind. I wanted to fill them with diamonds and gold. You will. Ethan, I had a dream. So did I. No, I mean a dream about gold. Gold? Oh, maybe it sounds silly, but I really did. A misty sort of dream about a mountain of gold. A black mountain with a sunny peak like... like a beckoning finger in the sky. Seemed to be California. You mean you want to go? Tomorrow. Anna. And we'll come back, Ethan. With our pockets bulging gold flowers for your hair. We'll come back to Hoyt City to finish what we've begun. We had a hundred dollars to our name that night. We needed a thousand. Ethan went down into town to see how much he could raise. <laughs> he got as far as the second saloon. And then he ran into Steely Edwards. Steely ran a month ago. Right over here, friends. Try your luck with Steely Edwards. You can't lose without trying. It's all in the cards. Three card money. The game's crooked. The cards are fixed. You can't win. Step right up. I take no bets from paupers, widows, orphans, or cripples. Go ahead, Ethan. Take a chance. Well, who's Ethan? Well, Ethan, want to lose your money? I've got $100 on the eight. I on the eight, friend. Now, watch closely. Here it is. Now, here. Here. And, uh, now where? Uh... Here. <laughs> no, friend. Here. Oh. I told you you can't win, friend. You're beaten before you start. I'll try it again. Yeah, for what stake? My horse. Your horse? Very foolish. I am the ace, friend. Now watch closely. Here it is. Now here. Now here. And uh, now where? Here. It's all too bad, mister. It's here. Now suppose we try it once again. I've got a workhorse. A workhorse? Well, here we go again. Now watch the ace and watch it fall. everything he had, Steely. Did you go up and collect those horses? Yep, got the rest of the stuff, too. I'll check it off against the list. Two horses. Two horses. Two cows. That's right. Chicken. And a horse. What? Wife. Oh, well. <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> counting on you, madam, but I assure you, after I get the animal to set it down for I the didn't night, come here to talk nonsense, Miss Edwards. You better be careful. You know, that gun might go off. Yes, it might. You're a very frightening young lady. I want everything you took from my husband. I want it all back. Well, naturally. But that's contrary to the sport. Sport? 
You call it sport to cheat a man, to take advantage oh, when no, he... No, 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 he was only slightly mad at him. Besides, he enjoyed losing. You know, that's what Monty is for, to give enjoyment to the working man. I want oh. everything he lost. Would you really shoot? Try me. <laughs> no, sir. Now, madam, you're welcome to the livestock, but uh, as for the money, I don't see your view for it. I want that, too. We need it. Oh, so do I. I'll tell you what. I won't give you the money back, but uh, I'll play you for it. Against what? Against, uh, what have you got to offer? Nothing. <laughs> don't be so modest. You know, a pretty woman always has something to offer. Let's, uh, let's say a kiss, shall we? If you think you... Otherwise, you'll have to shoot me. Very unprofitable. Well? All right. But I'll shuffle the card. <laughs> Certainly. Your deal, madam. Well, I got everything back. Of course, Tilly let me win. <laughs> and then Ethan and I went to California. For eight wonderful, terrible years, we wandered up and down the Pacific coast. Wonderful times when Ethan and I were together. Terrible times when he was away. And every time he came home, there was Tilly Edwards. Yes. He tagged along after me for eight years. I... I can't say I mind it much. There was something wonderful about Steelane. But that's as far as it went. I love Ethan too much. Come on, Hannah, get your hat. <laughs> I bought two tickets for the concert tonight. I can't go, Steely, but thanks. Oh, thanks. You know, that's what you always say. By this time, you ought to know what I mean. I don't know. All I know Steely, is... Steely, do me a favor. Anything. Go down to the Pharaoh house and leave me alone. I thought you said you didn't like gambling. Well, I don't call it working for a living. I suppose Ethan never gambled in his life. That's got nothing to do well, with it. Well, that's just the point. For eight years, he hasn't had anything to do with anything but himself. Except when he comes home for a bath or to change his clothes. Or... Oh. I'm sorry, Steely, but you deserve that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I did. Anyway, those eight years are over. Things will be different now with Ethan and me. You see, I... I'm going to have a child. A baby, huh? Well, that's... That's, that's fine, Hannah. That's, that's great. <laughs> I... I guess you won't be going any place for a while. No. Well, uh... I'll run along. Good night, Hannah. Good night, dear. Leaving, Edward? Who's that? Oh, is that you, Hoyt? Yeah. So you're back, huh? Well, welcome home. Thanks. I figured you'd be glad to see me. Did you have luck this time? No, did you? I'm not so sure I get that. Suppose I explain it, or maybe you'd better explain how it is I happen to run into you every time I come home. You'd better get inside. Hannah's waiting. Come here. Now, you take your hands off, friend. We're going to settle this thing right now. Well, that's all right with me. But I think I ought to tell you, I, uh, I never carry a gun. Well, lucky for you. Now get out of here and stay out. Coffee, Ethan? No, 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 thanks. Oh, it's wonderful to have you back. I've got so much to tell you. Ethan, I'm... Uh, Hannah, will it keep? Oh, uh, I suppose. So. Then save it for morning, will you? I'm tired. Dog tired. Got a spare bed for a miner down on his luck, Mrs. Hoyt? Yes, of course. Good. Your bed's all ready. I've just got to turn down the covers. Oh. Was there anything doing this trip, Ethan? No, no, no. Same old story, little gold, but you can't get it out of that blue stuff. Dickie's pitch, blue stuff. Some people claim it's silver, but they're crazy. Just get them away. Lie down, darling. I'll take off your boots. Uh, oh, watch out. It's all over them. Blue clay. Mm, that's messy, isn't it? Yeah. Strange country up here. Virginia City, a black hill called the Sun Mountain. Like a finger beckoning from the sky. Sun Mountain? Yeah. A mountain of blue clay. 
Ethan. Ethan, are you asleep? I'm mountain. Like a finger beckoning in the sky. My husband, it was on his boots. I thought I'd take a chance and have it assayed right away. That was no chance. This stuff was silver. Silver? Literally solid. It'll run $5,000 to the ton. If Steely Edwards here, I've got to see him right away. Right over there at the bar. Thanks. Steely! Steely! Why, Hannah, well, at your service, madam. Steely, listen, we're rich. Well, good. Who? Ethan, Ethan and me, he found silver, Steely, tons of it. Tons of silver? I've got to get him out of town now, tonight. The word's going around. They'll mob him to find out about it. Can you lend me some money? For him? For me, to buy the mines. I'll pay it back. Oh, please, Steely, every cent I'll scrub, I'll cook, I'll pay it all back. And, uh, you're going to stay here? Yes. And he'll let you stay? Oh, he doesn't know about the baby. I, I can't tell him. He wouldn't go, not if he knew. You, you wouldn't go, Steely. No. Oh, don't you see? It's his chance. It's what he's been looking for, grubbing and digging his way through the mountains for eight years. He's got to go, Steely. Alone. If some woman ever felt like that about me, if her name was Hannah, how much do you want? Oh, Steely. Steely, thank you. Ethan, wake up. Huh? Ethan, listen. What is it? What's the matter? Oh, get dressed quick. The whole town's on its way here. You've got to get out. What, what? Silver, that blue stuff on your boots. Silver? Solid silver. Here, put them on quick. They'll be here any minute. Go out the back way. Here, take this. What is it? Money to buy the mine. Money to buy... Where'd you get it? Oh, hurry, Ethan. Don't stop to argue. Where did you get it? Steely Edwards. Yeah. That's what I thought. You're coming with me, Hannah. No. Why not? I can't. Why not? I, I can't tell you, Ethan. You can't tell me. Well, maybe I can guess. Look at me. Yes, Ethan. You can't tell me. No. Then I know. Oh, Ethan, please. Well? You can't go like this thinking what you're well, doing. What else am I to think? What else? Ethan, they're here. You have to go. All right. Tell Edwards he'll have his money inside a week. Oh, no, no. You can't come back in a week. You'll have to stay. I'll send the money. I'm not coming back myself at all. Goodbye, Hannah. Ethan! Goodbye, Ethan. Good luck. Pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Before Mr. DeMille presents Act Three of The Great Man's Lady, starring Barbara Stanwyck, Joseph Cotton, and Chester Morris, here's another round of our conservation quiz. Questions on how to help clothes last longer by caring for them correctly. Here's our first contestant, Sally, Mrs. William Johnson of North Hollywood. And our first question, Mrs. Johnson, is, should a girdle be left once a week, several times a week, or once every two or three weeks? Uh, several times. Several times a week is best if you want to get the best kind of wear from it. If soil and perspiration are left in the fabric, they tend to weaken its elastic qualities. Luxing takes away soil and perspiration very gently. Helps girdles last and keep their fit longer. And, Mrs. Johnson, you'll find this box of new, improved Lux Flakes will last a long, long time, too. It's very thrifty. Well, that leads right into our second question, Mr. Kennedy. And Mrs. John Sutherland of Los Angeles will try to answer it, Sally. Now, listen carefully, Mrs. Sutherland. If two tablespoons full of Lux will wash a day's underthings and stockings, just two tablespoons full, how long will a large box of Lux Flakes last? Fourteen days or twenty-eight days or almost two months? If you're not sure, take a guess. Uh, twenty-eight days? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> One big box of new improved Lux will do stockings and undies every single day for almost two months. That's practically all the rest of the summer. Don't forget that your slips and other undies will wear better, look new longer when you wash them the gentle Lux way. Follow the directions right here on the box, Mrs. Sutherland, and you won't make any slips in washing. You'll save two ways. Lux things last longer, and Lux lasts longer, too. 
It comes in the same familiar box, but it's better than ever before. New, improved Lux Flakes. Now Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. You're invited to meet our stars in person after the play. But now the curtain rises on the third act of The Great Man's Lady, starring Barbara Stanwyck, Joseph Cotton, and Chester Morris. Anna Hoyt has paused in her story, dreaming of the past, her eyes closed as if in sleep. The girl reporter waits for a moment, then gently touches the old lady's hand. Mrs. Hoyt, I'm not asleep, girl. Mrs. Hoyt, the baby, was it ever born? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Young Ethan was born in the summer of 1850. It was just two, the year of the Sacramento flood. The flood? You were in that? Yes, we all were. The people started to desert the town one night in December. I had just finished packing when Billy Edwards came to the house. Sealy. Get out of the rain. Oh, you're a godsend, Sealy. I had no idea it was this bad. Take the baby. Help us down to the boat. The boat? We're going to San Francisco. That's where you're going, isn't it? Yes, yes, but... Well, then come on. You always said you wanted to take me on a trip. If you wait any longer, it'll be too late. It's been too late ever since I met you the first time, Hannah. What do you mean? You're not going to San Francisco. You're going to Virginia City, where he is. Oh, no. No, Sealy, I can't. Why not? I've never even heard from him. Now, look, Hannah, you love him. That's all that matters. All your life, you've gone back to it. Come on, swallow your pride. Do it once more. You see, young Ethan's never heard from him either. He had the ticket for me. I'm the stage to Virginia City. All night we traveled through that door. The horses floundering in mud to their knees. And then, towards dawn, we reached the bridge. Yes, sir! We'll never get across this bridge. The foot underwater right now. Let's dive and swim! Oh, Ethan, hush, baby. Mother's here. But if you don't, it's all right, Mother, Ethan. Mother, we come back. We're going to see Daddy, Ethan. You're going to see your daddy. Stop! Stop! Come here! Get back! Get off the bridge! Help! Help! Hurry up! Hurry up! If my son were alive today, he'd be 83 years old. He died that morning in the flood. There was no use in going on to the finish this Ethan had heard about the child, and he thought I was dead, too. A year later, I found out that Ethan had married again. But I know now what you meant when you said, come back in a hundred years. A hundred years of greatness and heartbreak, of sorrow. I went to San Francisco then. To work in Steely Edwards' place, the Crystal Palace. I was still there in 1868 when a gentleman playing at one of the tables asked to see me. The gentleman was my father. Steely's office. Hammer? I'm so glad to see you, Father. I thought of you Stop so... Stop it, Hammer. I came here with a business proposition, nothing more. A what? Everyone thinks you're dead. So did I until today. I want you to remain dead, legally. I don't know what you mean, Father. You still call yourself Hammer Hoyt. Yes, I'm married to Ethan. But he's married to J.B. Dawson's daughter back in White City. He has a fine reputation, a fine home, a son. Uh, a son? Hammer, I want you to change your name and go away. Far away somewhere. I'll make it worth your while. It means everything to me, everything. If you don't do it for me, do it for Ethan. He 
He's in trouble enough now, and the least breath of scandal would ruin him. Dawson and I need him in Congress. He's running against a hothead from White City, a dreamer who thinks that building White City is more important than building a railroad. Why, great Scott, if Ethan's not elected, I hate to think what it would mean for all of us. Please go. What? Please go, Father. For the last time, time, please go. Very well, Hannah. The house wins, gentlemen. The house always wins. Place your bets, please. Steely, I want to speak to you. What's the matter? I'm going back to Hoyt City. No more bets, gentlemen. Is it Ethan? Yes, he's in trouble. He needs me. Double, gentlemen. The game is against you. Better luck next time. Better luck yourself, Steely Edwards. Yeah. Thanks. Goodbye, Hannah. Goodbye. You know where I found Ethan? In our little cabin. The house he had built for me. He had come back to our home. To be alone. And think. Hannah. Hannah, is is that you? Yes, Ethan. This afternoon, I, I thought I saw you. In the crowd, when I was speaking. Yes, I didn't, I. I was bringing you your son. My son? Yes, Ethan. Forgive me, Hannah. I failed you. I've always failed you. No, you've gone forward the way you were supposed to go. That's what I wanted for you. I'm like a blind man now, Hannah. Man in the dark. No, you'll see again. You'll see what you yourself used to see better than any man on earth. A fine, bright world. We started to build it once. Not as simple as that. I've changed. I came back here alone and tried to build what we dreamed together, you and I. It was no good, Hannah. The heart was gone out of me. I took the easy way, just like I've always done. Except when you've been around to keep me straight. And now you're in trouble. I'm in just as deep as the rest of them. Corrupting judges and legislators to get what we want. Money is the great power, Hannah, and my money is tied up with the railroad. If I fight the politicians now, I'll be fighting myself. But that's right. That's what you must do. You've got to help me, Hannah. I can't do it alone. You're not alone. You have a family. Yes. As you too, Hannah. No, I'm all mixed. No, you're not. I've divorced you. When? Before I came here. Or not because I don't love you. I always will. But because our marriage was the only weapon they could use against you. I won't let you do you've this, You've got Hannah. to. And you've got to work for all the things we dreamed together. Speak for the truth and fight for it. Speak for all the people to hear. Help them to build something fine and free. A country that... That your little boy... That all our children will be proud to inherit and live in. If only we were beginning all over. Spring never comes again, Ethan. Ethan went on from there. Went on into greatness and glory. He used his greatness like a beacon to give men hope. Men building cities and a nation. Do you mind if I say something? No, no, speak ahead, girl. I think that statue in the park is the wrong person. It ought to be you. Oh, nonsense, girl. Behind the deeds of every great man, you will always find a woman hidden in the shadows. Working with him, striving for him, urging him onward. No man is ever really great without a woman at his side. But the woman is only a helping hand. What Ethan did, he did alone. I never saw him again until he came back home in 1906. He stood in the doorway one spring morning. His hair all silvery in the sunlight. He was holding out his hand. Smiling at me. So sad. I've come back, Hannah. I've come home to die. The people heard he was there in my house. They came to pay him homage. Fine, Ethan, fine. <laughs> you 
you gave me the strength and the courage. But you did it alone, Ethan. All alone. No, 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 Hannah. You were with me every step of the way. I wanted you to be proud of me. I am proud of you, Ethan. Prouder than a cat with a dozen kittens. Hannah. Yes, Ethan. Come closer. stars will be back for a curtain call in just a moment. Tonight in North Africa, in the South Pacific, the Aleutians, all over the globe, Americans are fighting. If by doing one small thing here at home, you could send them more ammunition, more medical supplies, would you do it? Are you doing it? The thing I mean isn't exciting. It, it isn't glamorous. But it is important. It's collecting waste fats and greases from your kitchen and turning them in for salvage. Every spoonful of waste fat you can spare is needed. It contains glycerin, one of the things used in making war materials. One tablespoonful of waste fat saved a day adds up to a pound a month. Enough to fire four anti-aircraft shells at an enemy bomber. Well, here's what we do at our house. First, of course, we use what fats we can for frying and so on. Then, when we're through with them, we strain them into a clean tin can. Any kind of a fruit or vegetable or soup can. Then we take them to the butcher, and he turns them in to be made into gunpowder and other things our army needs. The cans you turn in will be salvaged as well as the fat. So don't use glass or paper containers that break or leak. Remember, every spoonful of waste fat you turn in is important. Save every bit. Turn it in promptly. Your butcher will pay you cash for it. And within 21 days, the fat you turn in will be helping to provide both ammunition and medical supplies for our men on the fighting front. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Three good troopers to back to our microphone now. As curtain call time comes for Barbara Stanwyck, Joseph Cotton, and Chester Morris. How does it feel to play the part of a woman 109 years old, Barbara? Wonderful, Joe. Just think, I could be Cecil B. DeMille's grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> well, what beautiful eyes you have, Grandma. <laughs> the better to see that TV is blushing. 
I, I'm just sunburned. <laughs> <laughs> See, Barbara, when, when the tip of my head gets sunburned, it's rather obvious. <laughs> Things like that could break up a whole play, Mr. Mill. I remember a story my father once told me about an actor who was playing a very tragic scene on the stage about 50 years ago. The audience was weeping copiously, including a small boy with long golden curls who watched the play from the wings. But in addition to crying, the boy was eating taffy, and the tears and the taffy were running down his face together. And just as the star said goodbye forever to his leading lady, he saw the tears and the taffy, and he couldn't stand it. He giggled right in the leading lady's face. <laughs> Who is the actor, Chester? It was my father, William Morris. Uh, and the great artist, too. I wonder whatever happened to the kid with the long curls. Well, I don't know. I, I, Joe, I think he went into pictures or something. His, uh, his name was Cecil DeMille. <laughs> And he had long curls. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> Time, times have changed. <laughs> you know, Barbara, a lovely lady who was actually in that scene is here in our theater audience tonight. Chester's mother, Mrs. William Morris. Oh, I wonder if she recognizes you, C.B. <laughs> Maybe I'd better change the subject. What's next week's play? Well, one of the biggest comedy hits Broadway and Hollywood have seen in years, Barbara. It's My Sister Eileen. And our stars will be Rosalind Russell, Brian Ahern, and Janet Blair. <laughs> My Sister Eileen is the story of two girls from the Middle West and their adventures in the wilds of New York. The play ran for two years on Broadway, and next Monday night, we'll have the same three stars you saw in the Columbia picture. Rosalind Russell, Brian Ahern, and Janet Blair. Sounds like standing room only, Mr. DeMille. Good, Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. I hope you all live to be 109. Ladies and gentlemen... The Lux Radio Theater has again been named as radio's best dramatic program in Movie Radio Guide's annual poll of listeners. To you, our audience, who gave us this honor, and to the editors of Movie Radio Guide, we send our thanks and a promise. A promise that the Lux Radio Theater will continue on the same standards that won this distinction. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theatre presents Rosalind Russell, Brian Ahern, and Janet Blair in My Sister Eileen. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Barbara Sandwich's next picture is the universal production for all we know. Joseph Cotton appeared tonight by arrangement with David O. Selznick and will soon be seen in the universal picture, Hers to Hold. The Great Man's Lady has been presented tonight through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, whose current production is Dixie, with Bing Crosby, Dorothy L'Amour, and Marjorie Reynolds. Heard in tonight's play were Faye McKenzie, Norman Field, Catherine Wiley, Roland Drew, Ruby Dandridge, Charles Calvert, Ernestine Wade, Leo Cleary, Fred Mackay, Charles Seal, Robert McKenzie, and Leon Ledoux. Our music was directed by Louis Silver. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in next Monday night to hear Rosalind Russell, Brian Ahern, and Janet Blair in My Sister Eileen. Folks, if you're not taking vitamins, summer's a good time to start. And here's your chance to start absolutely free. Just send your name and address to this station for your free sample of BIMS. BIMS are the amazing vitamin mineral tablets that give you all the essential vitamins and all the minerals commonly lacking. Remember, for your free sample, send your name and address to this station. Ask for your free BIMS. Offer goods in USA only. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.